Okay, well, hi folks, thanks for joining us. This is uh, Playing with Live Electricity, How to Maintain Live Games uh, Without Getting Burned. Uh, let me just uh, introduce myself. Uh, I am Chris Knowles, uh, and I wear two uh, game dev hats. Uh, the reason I'm involved with Irocon uh, is that in 2019 uh, I set up as a, a one-man indie uh, called Cyquest Ninja, uh, and I'm currently working on an open-ended uh, programming game uh, called Hexahedra. Um, now, as an indie, uh, I haven't actually launched anything yet, um, so other than telling you that you should all go and wishlist Hexahedra on Steam right now, uh, I'm not going to draw on that experience uh, for this talk. Uh, but my other hat is that I spend uh, about 25% of my time uh, working as a senior engine developer at Jagex. Um, so I went uh, part-time when I set up uh, as an indie, uh, but I joined Jagex in 2007, and since then uh, I've shipped three games, and I've spent about six years working on uh, RuneScape itself, and in that time I have done a lot of launches. Uh, and not all of them were smooth, um, and often those are the ones that teach you the most, and so it's that experience I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Uh, Jagex generally does uh, two updates a week, uh, one for RuneScape, uh, one for Old School RuneScape, and in fact we have got the Guinness World Record for being the uh, most prolifically updated MMO uh, video game. Uh, and so, you know, we really have got launching down to a fine art because we, we haven't really had any choice. Um, so let's imagine uh, that you have uh, finished a game or an update and you're ready to put it live, you know, you've play tested it, you know it's fun, you've polished it. Uh, what are your players going to see when you actually launch it? Uh, because you don't want them to see uh, something like this. Uh, or something like this. Um, and, you know, uh, it's less likely these days, but if you really go for it, you might even get them uh, to see this. Which isn't good. Um, but, you know, you might have a more subtle problem. Uh, it might be that players run into a bug uh, that prevents them progressing in some obscure circumstance. You know, there's a bug where uh, they get stuck if they do certain things in the wrong order, something like that. Uh, the nightmare scenario for RuneScape uh, is a rollback, uh, where an update causes you know such a huge problem it, it corrupts player saves or it absolutely trashes the in-game economy, something like that. That really we don't have any choice except to take this game offline uh, for for quite a few hours, while we then restore everyone's um, state from a backup, which means players lose progress. So if you've got a rare drop or you've killed a hard boss for the first time something like that that might get wiped but obviously that's very frustrating for the players we don't want to do it it's stressful for us it's just bad news uh, all around um, and in fact if you play runescape uh, you probably know that over the last month we've been dealing with the aftermath of a, of a very serious back-end problem uh, that left a significant chunk of players uh, locked out of the game for for some weeks and we're just now starting to get those players back into the game and um, that's been very painful. Uh, already a lot of work has gone on behind the scenes to make sure that the, the cause of this problem uh, won't be repeated, you know, can't be repeated, um, but the whole thing has been um, you know, uh, hard work for everyone and, and, and players haven't enjoyed it either. Now every time you do an update, um, something like this could happen, um, so you need to do what you can to reduce that risk. Um, it's worth saying up front, you can only ever reduce risk, you can't eliminate it, um, but there are lots of sensible steps that you can take uh, that keep the risks very low. Uh, and you need to be comfortable updating your game, uh, because not updating your game can also cause problems. Um, uh, so this isn't gaming related, but in 2013, uh, Microsoft Azure, which is their big uh, cloud service, uh, it stopped working uh, because they didn't update an SSL certificate, uh, which is awkward for anyone. It's even worse when you spent billions developing a, a big online cloud system and it comes down uh, because someone forgets to update a certificate. You know, and it was some years ago now, uh, but at one point Apple announced they were going to uh, remove all apps from the store uh, that didn't have a 64-bit build uh, from the iOS store. Uh, so if you weren't able or you were unwilling to do an update, um, then you'd be yanked off the store. I mean, you know, they did do that. Um, so, you know, your release process needs to be as easy as possible. Uh, you don't want it to be dangerous. You don't want uh, to be easy to miss stuff. Uh, you don't want to be hesitant to do it because it's difficult or it's dangerous. Um, now I'm going to come back to the process of actually doing the update uh, later on, but most of the time, when things go wrong, it's not because of the update process itself, it's a problem with the game. And so by far the best way to not get burned by playing with live electricity is to not play with live electricity in the first place. Um, you know, the best approach is to deal with all the change and uncertainty before you launch. Uh, you want to develop uh, processes and systems uh, that mean that you have confidence in how your game is going to behave out in the real world before you launch it. Uh, so there are a few categories of problems uh, that your players might run into and we'll take them all 
kind of one at a time. Um, so the first is what I'm going to call normal bugs. I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Um, and compatibility issues, that kind of thing. Uh, you've got issues that derive from the fact that you know the real world where your players are is not like the office, uh, or if you're an indie, or particularly an indie uh, in a pandemic, not like the home office. Uh, if your game has some sort of online component, um, then if you have some infrastructure uh, of your own that you need to that exists to support the game, you may end up with problems with that. Uh, and finally, there is then the deployment process itself. Um, actually, putting a new version of the game live—that's a thing that can go wrong. Um, so I'm not going to say much about the first category, like you could do a whole talk about QA testing and, and, and bug hunting in games, um, but by normal bugs I mean things like, uh, you know, one of the player's abilities doesn't work, or the game crashes when you equip the rocket launcher, or this door doesn't open, something like that. And compatibility issues is stuff like, you know, you develop the game uh, using an NVIDIA graphics card, and it then turns out there are, if you run it on an AMD card, there are some graphical glitches, that sort of thing. Um, now you'll need to work out, you know, what your QA strategy is. Um, you know, as indies, we often don't have the the benefit of a, a dedicated QA team, um, so maybe you're just going to get all the devs to pitch in. Uh, you might run uh, closed betas with your existing fans, and that can be a particularly helpful way actually to get compatibility uh, information because your your the players who come to your beta will probably have a, a wide array of of specs on their machines. Um, so if you can get them all to report their hardware um, specifications, then you can use that to kind of work out if any particular um, things have problems. Um, but whatever it is, you're going to have to uh, work out how to deal with you know, the issue of, of finding, uh, tracking down your bugs. Uh, one thing I will recommend uh, is doing as much automated testing as you can. Um, the games industry, and this is, this is anecdotal, but it seems to me that the games industry uh, is more hesitant than the rest of the software uh, world in doing things like unit testing uh, and there are some aspects of games that do make it trickier to unit test them so anything that touches something like a, a the physics engine something like that is tricky to test um, there's often lots of sort of I've been doing a lot of uh, UI work recently and um, you know your UI stuff often needs to know about state from all different kinds of bits of the game to sort of provide a uh, consistent view of the world and um, that can make it difficult to test but it is possible um, and I find that unit testing what you can usually pays uh, dividends. Um, and so I find actually that the value I mostly get out of writing unit tests isn't so much that I write the test and I find a bug in my code. But I mean, that does happen. Um, and it's not even so much the, the classic case of you write your code in the test and it all works. And then three months later, you do an update uh, and the tests break and that reveals that you've now um, broken something uh, in your game by making a change. But again, that, that does happen as well. But I find the real benefit I get out of unit tests is that just writing the test forces me to take a second look through the code in a really structured way, um, and that can reveal areas where my code is, is lacking. So it might be that I realize, oh yes, I need a unit test to deal with this particular edge case, and I'll then realize, hang on, I haven't even written the code in the game to deal with that edge case. So I go back to the game, write that, go and write the test, the test passes eventually, and you know, boom, there it is, the game is better. And so it's really, it's the second pass through the game um, that really um, gives you the value of tests. Particularly if you're a solo dev and you haven't got any code review process or anything like that uh, going on. Um, but there are other things you can automate. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, Crow Team, who made the Talos Principle, um, which is uh, uh, another puzzle game. It's very good. You should all go and play it. It involves bouncing a lot of lasers around, as you can see. Um, they created a bot um, that could play through uh, the entire game. And it wasn't in any way intelligent. They had to show it how to finish each level. Um, but it could run through the entire game very quickly. Um, so they could trigger it after the uh, after any, uh, on any, any new build. They could run it overnight. When it was running through the game, um, it could do it very quickly because they could just take the brakes off the physics engine and let it run as fast as the processor could cope with. Um, and that meant that if you know if someone changed some sort of bit of level geometry and broke a level because you could no longer bounce a laser from A to B, they could get feedback on that very quickly. And Crow Team have done presentations about this themselves, and they reckon that over the course of development, the bot did the equivalent of about 15,000 hours of playtesting, which is just massively valuable. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you might want to consider as well uh, whether you want to set up a machine to run through some sort of fixed performance test every time you do a build. Um, this can be a great way to sort of make sure that your minimum spec is kind of plausible. Um, so if you can get a machine that conforms to that minimum specification and you can run through a standardized test every time you make a change, you can check whether that performance is still acceptable. You know, And if you write uh, a fancy new shader that absolutely tanks the frame rate, you'll get feedback on that very quickly. Um, 
So the second category, where the real world isn't like the office, that's a bit trickier, because you're often dealing with stuff that isn't actually an outright bug, not getting errors thrown or anything like that, but there is some aspect of your game um, that means it doesn't work as well in the player's hands as you would expect. So, for example, uh, some of you might remember uh, this. Um, this was uh, The Division on launch day, uh, and what's going on here is that as part of the opening experience, you need to walk up to a laptop in the game and, and use the laptop. But the only problem was that each server only had one laptop, and only one player could use the laptop at once. And so what you're seeing here is the players literally forming an orderly queue uh, to get into the game they have just bought, which is not great. Um, but of course, it's important to point out that every time a QA tester went through this process, it worked absolutely fine. There aren't any bugs in it, and if you're on your own, it works perfectly. Um, the problem is that the design doesn't scale, it doesn't hold up in the real world. Um, and, you know, while we're talking about things scaling up, if you're doing online stuff, um, you need to test that your, uh, you know, your, your hardware infrastructure is going to cope with real-world load, load in terms of CPU usage, memory usage, that kind of thing. Uh, so you can run uh, what's often called a technical beta, uh, which is usually a pretty short test where you just throw as many people at your system as you can uh, and see whether you can cope with, you know, 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 players, whatever. Um, you know, if you're making something like an MMO, if you can support, say, 5,000 players on a, on a physical machine, and it might be there's lots of game worlds within that, but if you can support 5,000 players per box, uh, then your game might be financially viable. Um, if it turns out you can only support 50, it almost certainly isn't, because the overheads will be enormous. Um, getting players into your game early on can also help with finding bugs that might be a bit trickier to spot with sort of what you might call normal testing. Uh, we had that experience at Jagex uh, with Eight Realms, which was kind of a, a sort of Travian on steroids. Um, and this really was an outright bug, uh, but closed beta testing picked it up. Um, so when you were in the tutorial in this game, you were in a, a sort of a special tutorial server. And once you'd finished that, you were then put out into a normal server with other players. Uh, and for complex reasons I won't go into, it turned out that the tutorial server worked fine for the first 28 players, but for player 29 and onwards it broke at a certain point. And although we'd done lots of testing up to that point, because we were always putting out new builds and um, you know uh, resetting the data on our tutorial servers and that kind of thing, uh, we never had a server that lasted long enough to realise that for player 29 and onwards uh, the tutorial didn't work. Um, so, you know, do be aware that there may be some genuine bugs that are hard to test, are hard to spot with kind of your internal testing methods. Um, and again, if you're online, uh, is your game playable on, in, in real world networking conditions? So, you know, even if it runs fine in the office over a local network, uh, it might all fall apart once you've got players who are hundreds or thousands of miles away from each other. So you may well need some sort of client prediction or lag compensation uh, to mask the delay. Um, that comes with its own suite of problems, and you could do a whole talk about this, about players manipulating lag compensation to cheat and that kind of thing. Um, if you're doing peer-to-peer -peer networking, um, then what steps have you taken to deal with players who are being double-natted by their ISPs? Uh, so, you know, the world has run out of IPv4 network addresses, and so some ISPs are assigning a single address to multiple customers and kind of building a private network behind that. Um, and then when a message then gets to someone's home router, it does the same thing, and there's a little private network in your house, which is why, generally speaking, you know, your, your PC isn't addressable from the outside world. And, you know, messages can still get out. You can still get out and request a web page, and the, the return data can get to you. But there's no way, because of, there's no way to sort of make a direct connection uh, from a standing start to someone's device in their home in that situation, because there's no way to address it publicly. And so there might be situations where there are two players who just cannot connect each other over a peer-to-peer -peer connection unless you provide a central server they can both connect to and you can then route the messages uh, back and forth. Um, if you've got players idling in a lobby, um, you know, uh, if there's no, really is no traffic at all between the client and the, uh, and the lobby, um, some firewall somewhere in the middle might decide to close the connection to reclaim it. Um, and, you know, what are your players going to see if that happens? Will there be a nice elegant bit of behaviour? Will they just see an error message? How's, how's it going to cope? Um, 
yeah, so we'll talk about infrastructure itself. Um, and again, this is relevant to games with an online component. So if you're making a single player game and you're distributing it on Steam or Itch or GOG or whatever, uh, you know, the infrastructure to get your game into your players' hands uh, is more or less a solved problem. And Steam even has that nice thing where it makes sure the players only have to download the bits that have changed uh, and so on. But if you're creating, uh, if you've got some sort of online component to your game and you're creating your own infrastructure to support that, how are you testing that that works within itself? Um, there's, a, there's a classic tweet that sums up uh, the issue. Everybody has a testing environment. Uh, some people are lucky enough to have a totally separate environment to run production in. Um, so you have a test environment, and hopefully it's not the one you're making your players use. Um, and the ideal situation is to have a copy of, uh, well, this guy calls it the production environment, the Jagex, we tend to call it the live environment. Uh, you want a copy of that that you can test against. A Jagex, we call that the staging environment because it's where we put something that we think is ready to go out and just needs um, final checks. Um, and again, in order to avoid playing with live electricity, in order to avoid launching with unexplored changes, uh, you want to make this environment mirror the live environment as closely as you can. So, for example, if there is a firewall between two of your servers in live, put a firewall in your staging environment. Uh, make sure it uses the same firewall rules and make sure that those two servers can still talk to each other in staging. Um, I've had that problem in the past, working with something, something worked in staging, it didn't work in live. Um, I can't remember actually whether it was because the firewall setup was different or even maybe in staging the two processes were actually on the same machine and so there was no firewall at all. But essentially something worked in staging and not in live and it turned out to be because in live there was a firewall blocking some communication and that hadn't been picked up in staging because the staging environment didn't mirror the live environment closely enough. Um, as well as hardware, make sure your software lines up, make sure you're using the same version of all your software in staging and live. Um, so if you're using a particular version of some database software or you've got a proxy like Nginx, something like that, uh, make sure that if you upgrade in one place, you upgrade in the other place, keep everything lined up, minimize the amount of change you, that you're risking when you move between staging and live. Um, if you've got a system where you can scale up the number of servers uh, you have running uh, using some sort of cloud infrastructure so you can deal with spikes in load or something like that, make sure you can test that in staging as well. Um, and the thing you really need to not do, and the thing that is likely to cause disaster, is don't do all your testing just by spinning up all of the uh, infrastructure uh, locally on your test on your development PC and just make sure they can all talk to each other over a local loopback connection, because that way madness lies. Make sure your networking infrastructure has had a real outing before you actually go live. Um, you also need to consider, do you have any redundancy uh, and what are your recovery plans? So uh, if a single server's power supply melts through the floor, um, is the online part of your game going to be offline uh, for your players or can they carry on? You know, if you've got, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you're doing a multiplayer game and you've got lots of different game servers, if one game server goes down, obviously that's frustrating for those players, but everybody else on other servers can probably carry on. Um, but there are um, probably some systems where you do want one server that's one source of truth, for example, things like uh, player save data, that kind of thing. Uh, and so um, you need some kind of strategy for dealing with that going down. You want to minimise the time that it's down for. Um, and you, know, you need a strategy to cope with hardware failure. And that is you know, something you could spend an awful lot of money on uh, if you wanted to. Um, that's probably not really feasible if you're uh, an indie. Um, but you need a strategy for backing up that data because it's important um, and then getting a replacement server up and running as quickly as possible. Um, now, if you're getting someone else to do your hosting for you, uh, they may well provide some sort of network attached storage or NAS solution um, where, you know, what appears to be a server's hard drive uh, is actually just a, a chunk of data on a big sort of network cluster somewhere. And so if a machine or a virtual machine or whatever falls over for some reason and can't be recovered, um, the hosting providers can spin you up another server, present that same chunk of data on the NAS uh, as if it was a hard drive again, and effectively you've brought up another copy of the same server, um, and that can let you get players back into your game very quickly. So that's worth exploring if that's your kind of hosting setup. Um, but let's imagine, you know, you've done all of that, everything's tested, it works in staging, how do you actually launch without setting everything on fire? Um, well, actually, there probably is one last hurdle uh, you need to cross uh, before uh, you can actually launch your game, and that is getting it reviewed by the platform. Uh, now, if you're doing stuff on itch.io, you can launch whatever you want. Um, some platforms like Steam, uh, they will want to review your game once before you launch it the first time, um, but after that, you can put new builds out 
kind of at your leisure. But if you're making, say, an iOS game, um, Apple are going to review your app every time you want to release it. Uh, so you need to make sure you leave in enough time for that. Um, getting an app through review can be quite a chore. There are lots of human interface guidelines you have to comply with and how it behaves and lots of stuff like that. Um, even if you do have limited funding for QA, something you might want to consider uh, is getting an external QA company uh, to do uh, what's called a compliance run through your game. So they'll look all the way through it and give you a list of potential compliance violations that Apple or Google might object to. Um, you know, if you've never submitted an app before, you may not realise um, that when Apple review your app, if they find one compliance issue, they'll stop reviewing it right there, tell you about that one particular issue, and ask you to fix it and resubmit, and they'll check in again afterwards. Um, and at first that sounds daft, because they'll have to redo all the review up to that point when you resubmit, and then they might find some other problem later. But the reason they do that is that they do not want to be a free QA service for you. Um, by the time you're submitting your app for review, uh, it should be ready uh, to go out the door. And in theory, uh, the compliance check should be a formality. Uh, but it is very strict. So if you're porting a game from another system, if you tell your users to click on something rather than tapping something, that's a compliance failure. Um, you know, and, and getting an app reviewed can take days or weeks um, for them to get around to it. And so you don't want to go around that merry-go-round any more than you have to. Um, once your game is out, um, follow-up reviews tend to be a bit quicker, but even so. Um, and also, you know, um, once your game is live, um, always leave time for you know, a follow-up review to fail, uh, even if you haven't changed much, and even potentially for a somewhat strange reason, it's not unheard of uh, for an app to fail a review because, you know, the login system doesn't work. Um, but, you know, it then turns out, if you dig into logs, that what's actually happened is the tester has typed in the password incorrectly and they've just given up. So yes, always, it always leaves time uh, to fail review, even if not much has actually changed. But hey, let's assume we've got that out of the way, uh, we really are now ready to launch our game. Uh, the first question you need an answer to before you go and poke your live environment is this. What are you going to do if it goes wrong? Uh, and following on from that, uh, how are you going to know if it's gone wrong? Um, hopefully, uh, the first sign you get of problems won't be players posting in your Discord server uh, or even you know Reddit or Twitter or somewhere else nice and public um, that they're having problems. Are you able to verify that the update process itself was successful and that the game is working in live? Um, and if the update process itself is successful but players run into problems, are you able to quickly get uh, the previous working version back up or are players going to have to wait around for a fix? Um, so I'm calling that a rollback, not in the same sense of, you know, what we talked about with, with RuneScape having to revert players' save data or anything like that, just getting the previous version of the game back out so players can use that again. Um, but do be aware, um, if you're trying to do that, of updates where you've done something like you've changed the save game format, um, because that, if you've done that, you might not be able to roll back to the previous version without breaking things for players who've already started up the new version because their save game has changed and the old version of the game won't be able to understand it. So you may end up locking them out. Always, always be aware when you do an update, is this an update where we can apply, where we can roll back if we need to, or are we going to have to stick with and fix the new version? Um, in RuneScape, we pr can pretty much never revert back to an earlier version because almost every update involves um, some new item or some new player variable that would end up in a player's save. Uh, and if we did um, revert back to a, uh, an earlier version of the game, it wouldn't be able to understand um, that data. So what we have instead uh, is a hotfix system uh, that allows us to uh, deploy changes to the game's scripts without actually rebooting the servers. Um, and so that means that either we can, well, we can fix a problem outright without a shutdown or even if we can't we can um, either work around it or we can uh, disable access to a particular um, broken bit of content um, as a hotfix and then we can work on a proper uh, update offline which will then require us to shut things down and start them up again. Um, all right, what about the deployment itself you know why might that go wrong? Um, there are two main reasons why your update process might go wrong. Uh, one is just doing too much stuff manually. Um, so humans are fallible, it's easy for us to do things wrong, it's easy to miss a step to, you know, fat finger something, press enter at the wrong time, use the wrong config file, whatever it is. Um, but the other thing that can cause problems uh, is doing too much stuff automatically. Um, so uh, if you have a process which is too automated, um, you run the risk that it might press on when a problem occurs rather than realising that and stopping, uh, and, and it just carries on and, and does too much. 
So if you wanted to have a, a totally automated update process uh, for an online game, you'd have one big red button and you'd hit that, um, and that would uh, deploy a new version of the game to the servers. Um, it would push a new version of the client out to wherever players are getting that from. Uh, it would then tell the live servers to shut down and then to boot up the new version. Um, but you'd then in a, end up in a pickle if some part of that process went wrong, but everything carried on. So if one game one game server didn't get the update, for example, um, then when everything's back up again, um, you know, players on the new client will connect to that old server and they'll have a bad time because it won't they won't quite know what they're talking about. And you might end up with even bigger problems where, you know, um, you know, uh, none of the game servers get updated, but the client goes out, or the game servers all get updated and the new client doesn't go out, and suddenly nobody can play because the client and the server are no longer talking uh, the same language. Um, so really what you want is a happy medium. Uh, you want a, a strategy of sensible automation. So you do want to automate chunks of your process because you want to reduce the risk of human error of a person forgetting to do something, making a mistake. Um, but you do need to leave a few points during the process that need manual intervention because that's a point where a human being can go in and make sure everything is the way it's supposed to be and, and can decide whether or not we should carry on or whether we should give up before things get worse. Um, do you make sure your process is documented uh, and that the documentation is up to date? Uh, so when I'm doing a launch, I really do just have a checklist of things and I work through them all and I tick them off to make sure I don't forget anything. Um, but that only works if the documentation is up to date. Um, do you make sure you check the output of each step to make sure that the, you know, the world is the way you think it should be and that things are okay? Of course, that means you need to provide enough output from each step to make that call to know that things have worked uh, the way they're supposed to. Um, you might want to consider also making it possible to do a dry run um, where you know you don't update anything but your process kind of checks that things look like they should have worked you know you have a process that says well could I contact all of the live servers that I expected to be able to do they all seem to be okay you know does it like I could have pushed out an update to all of them if it came to it um, now no system is perfect um, errors are going to eventually happen if you update enough times um, but all of this stuff, you know, testing for bugs, uh, making sure your your systems work in the real world, um, make sure you're making sure your infrastructure works, having a robust deployment process, all of that reduces the risk of something going wrong, and it should put you in a better position uh, when something eventually does. But there is one important final thing to remember uh, for when things do inevitably go wrong, and that is, don't panic. Um, things are broken. It's a pain. Players aren't happy. But it's better to take things slowly and fix them rather than rush something out and make the problem worse. Um, now that's not easy to do. It's easy for me to sit here and say, oh, don't panic. Much harder to do. Uh, if you're not a solo dev, then do grab a friend, someone who can sit with you. Um, even if they're not a technical person, they can't really help you with it, but they can at least, you know, keep you on an even keel. You know, if I had a, a, a live issue, I'd probably gonna grab my wife. Uh, now she's a software engineer, um, but she hasn't actually, you know, um, worked on the game so she probably can't help me actually fix it, but she can stop me running around like a headless chicken. Um, but all being well, you won't be in that situation all that often. I hope all your launches are smooth and successful, and I hope your players love your game.